Outback Stories celebrates the pioneering spirit of Australia. It makes little difference if your family came on the first fleet or on a leaky boat last week. Our unique national identity was born and bred in the Outback. These are your stories. The tent poles are rotten and the campfire's dead And the possums may ramble in the trees overhead I'm out on the wallaby Humping me drum And I'll camp on the road where the sun down has come It is difficult to imagine the Australian outback without picturing the iconic campfire. Throughout history, it has been a meeting place, a welcoming warmth and a sign that all's well in the bush. Poets and storytellers have celebrated it. Artists painted it and photographers captured it on film. Australia with my pint pot and billy Making tea in the shade of the gum tree again We now freely bestow the word iconic on all and sundry but the campfire is intrinsically linked to the mythology of the Australian bush In our mind's eye We know what it sounds like, what it looks like, and what it smells like. First Australians created fire with traditional skill and carefully carried it as they migrated across territories. It was the centre of Indigenous community life for cooking, warmth, play, dance and ceremony. The charcoal from the fires was used to create art and decorate the body. For the early European settlers bound for up country, the evening campfire was seen as a place of relative safety from exhausting travels through the often hostile bush. It also kept wild animals and reptiles, especially dingoes and snakes, at bay. Certainly the hundreds of thousands of new chum gold seekers of the 1850s and 60s rushes, knowing very little of bush life, must have seen the campfire as a place to reflect, renew their spirits, and most importantly, share news with fellow travellers as part of the legendary Bush Telegraph. You have to travel to broaden your mind, see how things is. In the tent cities of the Gold Rush, exhausted and desperate diggers collapsed around their campfires as they dreamt of home families and fortunes to be made. For the working men of the outback, and they were mainly men in the 19th century, the drovers, bullockies, boundary riders, station hands and other itinerant workers, the campfire played a major role in everyday life. Bushmen know that although their days on the road could be blisteringly hot and dusty, at night a bone-shaking chill often descends. One of the most important aspects of the campfire was that it was considered neutral territory. There was no hierarchy, and the boss, general hands, and even the dogs 
were equal around the fire. Food was shared, the talk was free and easy, and the billy was always on the boil as the fire crackled and sparked. For most of these bush workers, it was also where they laid their blanket roll as they looked up at the stars and fell to slumber until the bushman's alarm clock, the kookaburra's laugh, called them out to their work day. I have humped my bluey in all the states with my old black billy, the best of mates. For years I've camped and toiled and tramped on roads that are rough and hilly with my plain and sensible indispensable old black billy my old black billy my old black billy sheep and cattle droving life was centred around the campfire. The cookie was up before the break of day to rebuild the fire and prepare the breakfast, cook the day's damper and boil the all-important tea. There would be another fire built for the billy tea at lunchtime before the cook and the droving plant made for the evening's campsite and waited for the drovers to arrive. This was a bigger fire, for it had to handle the evening meal, provide warmth through the night, and of course, keep the ever-boiling billy ready. In the bush of Australia, you all are aware, there are plenty of hardships and very rough fare. But with flour, fat and sugar, I think you'll agree, a man can turn out some nice fritters for tea. The herd or flock was usually pastured near the campfire. The animals were reassured by the flickering light and the hum of conversation. It also enabled the drovers and their dogs to keep one eye on the animals and one ear listening for dingoes. The outback campfire was held together by yarning gentle conversation about the things that mattered in life. Cattle, sheep, heat, rain and dogs. Some of the wildest stories imaginable were told. Never doubted, well not openly, often repeated and always welcomed. I had a kelpie once named a magpie who could work anything. Ha, do you remember that grasshopper plague last year? I left Magpie at the camp for a day and when I came back she was working six grasshoppers round a tin plate. They were so obedient not one would dare fly off. Others would tell of a dog that would work two blowflies down the neck of an old tomato sauce bottle. In the heydays of the Swaggies, especially after the gold rush in the late 1860s and again in the 1890s when Australia's boom ride busted and the east coast of the country was hit with the double whammy of the Shearer's strike and a crippling drought, thousands of men and women went on the wallaby track, carrying swags, sleeping by river bends and moving around the country looking for, and in some cases, avoiding work. A similar thing happened during the Great Depression of the 1930s. These were mean and lean times, and the evening campfire offered solace to the army of swag travellers. There were reports that up to 200 Swaggies would gather in the same area 
around various campfires. At one stage, in western New South Wales, it was even reported that a swagman's union had been established. It had a coat of arms of a billy, swag and walking stick, and it had a set of rules, including 1. No member to be over 100 years old. 2. No member to carry a swag weighing over 10 pounds. 3. No member to allow himself to be bitten by a sheep. If a sheep bites a member, he must immediately turn it into mutton. 4. No member to look for or accept work of any description. Members found working will be expelled. And 5. No member to pass any station, farm, boundary rider's hut, camp or private house without cadging rations. The image of the swaggy carrying his blanket roll, his Matilda, is well known to Australians. We have romanticised the swaggies, but it was a tough life, walking for miles to get government sustenance payments, humiliated by having to beg for rations, and generally toughing it out forever on the move, in rain, hail or heat. It was far from the mythical, jolly swagman portrayed in Banjo Patterson's Waltzing Matilda. There were lots of characters in the outback. One woman, a swaggy in Queensland, dressed in old Hessian bags, was known as Annie Bags and would regularly walk between Charters Towers and Ravenswood, always accompanied by a pack of dogs. She picked wildflowers and made them into posies to sell, singing, From Ravenswood to Charters Towers, won't you buy my pretty flowers? Lonely. As lonely as a bandicoot on a burned ridge. Loneliness was a problem that increased anxiety. Many of the swag fraternity travelled with a dog as a mate. Me and me dog have tramped together in cold weather and hot. Me and me dog don't care whether we get any work or not. There were many types of swaggy. Some referred to themselves as professional swagmen, others as Rhodes scholars, but rarely as tramps, bums or hobos. They liked to retain a certain dignity, even in the hardest of times. Their skills were in survival and cadging rations of friendly station owners. The squatters were also facing hard times, but most were as helpful as their pantry would allow. Typical handouts included measures of flour, tea, sugar, and when available, some meat. Station cooks, sometimes with the encouragement of the shearers, in reality their bosses, were also generous to swaggies. One class of swaggy was called the sundowner. It was usual for swaggies to do some light labour in exchange for rations. Not this fellow, who got his name for arriving at the station door just as the sun dipped. Too dark for work, missus. Work hard? Why, they used to put a bag over the sun so we couldn't see it go down. Aggressive station owners with mean reputations were given short thrift, gates left open, and a threat that they should watch out for a visit from their mates, Bryant and May. 
That was the popular brand of matches. In the 1890s, several shearing sheds and barns were destroyed by unaccountable fire, no doubt courtesy of Bryant and May. Hurrah for the Lachlan boys, and join me in a cheer. That's the place to go to make an easy check each year. With a toad skin in me pocket, I borrowed from a friend. Ah, oh, isn't it nice and cosy to be camping in the bend? Singing and reciting poetry around the campfire were popular with bush travellers. Bullockies were very fond of playing old dance tunes on instruments like the concertina and accordion. Drovers and shearers loved reciting the great works of poets such as Henry Lawson and Banjo Patterson, especially when they heard stories about their own lives. And after the shearing is over And the wool season's all at an end It is then you will find a flush shearer They loved songs about drovers, stockmen and shearers and they readily passed them around the campfire. Half-remembered songs would be added to and performed a few nights later hardly recognisable from the original. Many songs and poems were personalised. Names of mates or famous shearing sheds popped up in the verses. Above all, the drovers and shearers loved to hear boasting songs about how good they were in everything from working to drinking, as lovers and as horse riders and, of course, they never let the truth get in the way of a good yarn. Some of the greatest lawyers, <laughs> uh, the man that could ride the best, he couldn't sit on a fence on a windy day as a rule. The Australian campfire is a living part of the Outback Bush story.